And there's Bob. Oh, hi, Mike. I didn't see you down there in the corner. <laughs> hi, Ellen. Morning. Hey there. Hi, Ellen. I didn't see you either. Okay, let's see. Sounds like our leader is coming aboard. There's our blessed <laughs> pastor. His leader. <clears throat> He's muted, though. <laughs> Hi, Melissa. Hey, Sharon. How do you call an amoeba? On a cell phone? <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Oh boy. You are with that your morning words of wisdom. <laughs> it doesn't get much deeper. <laughs> I thought you were talking about Kim's lesson this weekend for the kids. <laughs> okay, I need to watch that one. I just watched the faith service this morning. Oh, her lesson is really good, as always. And thank you very much, Pastor Will, for a wonderful message this week. Boy, for sure. Yep. You're welcome. Oh, I was supposed to be a greeter today. <laughs> <laughs> when I you was supposed greeting to be greeting everybody. Oh, good morning, everybody. I'm greeting you. <laughs> there you go. Good morning. good morning. I was supposed to greet last weekend at 6 a.m., so there are advantages to this pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I was supposed to greet Monday, Thursday. <clears throat> okay, good morning, everyone. Morning. morning. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> is that muted? No, yours is not muted. Or is it? Is the mic muted? Okay, the mic's muted, we're fine. Uh, good morning, everyone. We <laughs> we might have people visiting us here for, there we go. We might have people visit uh, joining us late today. Uh, I think this is actually my fault. In fact, I know that it's my fault because I should have created a, a different meeting with a different meeting ID and I should have sent that out through Stephanie's, um, you know, kind of, weekly workload this last week. And I did not do that because I thought that the meeting kept repeating uh, in the schedule. And uh, so unless you went to your original email and then use that same ID number to get into this uh, session, uh, you may be struggling to, to find us here on Zoom. So uh, we may have folks joining as we go. Uh, I'll certainly record, it's, I mean, it's recording now, I'll record this entire session and put it up on the uh, YouTube channel later. Uh, I'm really, this is actually a, a pretty significant mistake on my part because we're gonna get into some real meat and potatoes today. So I really hate it that some folks are gonna have trouble joining, but I'm glad uh, for those of you who were able to join today, uh, we're gonna really get into it here, okay? So you wanna open your Bibles to Revelation chapter five. There you go. Revelation chapter five. Uh, we're going to look at um, the scroll and the lamp. Before Easter, we um, looked at the the vision of the heavenly throne room, you know, and so that's where we were before Easter. Now we're picking up in the next chapter, chapter five, uh, with the the scroll and the lamp. So let me see. Um, Share my screen with y'all, and then we're going to get into PowerPoint slides here. Okay, everybody see what what I'm seeing? Okay. Yeah. Good. So you see the revelation there? Yes. I'm going to minimize this for now. Okay, good. Um, so we're in uh, chapter five, and we're going to look at the, the scroll and the lamb. I'll just read the entire chapter, and then we'll get into it. So it says, Then I saw 
in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written uh, within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And uh, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne <clears throat> and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Okay, so, so far the, the text there. Um, in Revelation 5, Jesus is first introduced by his human lineage and as the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David. Okay, so uh, Jesus is appearing in his heavenly glory as the lamb who was slain, and yet uh, he is first introduced by his human lineage. So uh, he's very much the lion of the tribe of Judah, that's his tribe, and he is the root of David. Now this is a funny um, sort of of talking when you think about it because he's not the offshoot of David with, with David being his root. Uh, Jesus is the root of David. It's the other way around. Um, I preached a sermon <clears throat> once on Christmas Eve here. Um, I was new and frankly um, I was getting used to y'all and y'all were getting used to me and sometimes the way that I talk is, is funny. And, I preached on Psalm 8 for Christmas Day, I think it was. I don't think it was Christmas Eve, it was Christmas Day. I preached on Psalm 8, and Psalm 8 talks about the Son of Man, and that uh, th that term Son of Man in Hebrew there in Psalm 8 is not ben Enosh or ben Ish, which would be the ways in Hebrew to say Son of Man generically. It's ben Adam, so the Son of Adam. Um, and so, uh, Jesus is actually the, the pattern for mankind rather than the other way around. So um, the fact that Jesus took on our flesh, that's called the incarnation. But if you remember from Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 1 through 3 there, uh, mankind was made in God's image. So um, God takes counsel within himself, uh, the Godhead, the three in one, and and he says, let us make man in our own image. And so uh, mankind was patterned on the coming of Christ from the very beginning. And so uh, Jesus here is not pictured as the offshoot of David. Please stop fidgeting. I love you. But you're right next to me and you're fidgeting. And I love you very deeply. Okay. <laughs> All right. So... Um, Jesus is not described as the offshoot of David. He's described as the root of David. Okay, so uh, he is really the basis for David's whole throne because God made a covenant with David uh, that he would, that God would place David and his royal house on the throne over his people and that David would always have a, a son and an, an offspring uh, on his throne. And so here is Jesus, the root of David. He is uh, God and man now forever. He will now forever have this human lineage. Uh, indeed, he always did have this human lineage via prophecy. So in other words, Jesus' birth, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, his birth was not an accident of 
uh, human history, but rather uh, was always prophesied. And um, so he always had this human lineage because it was foretold that he had this human lineage, okay? Um, and it is by virtue of his suffering that he is glorified and declared worthy, which leads uh, into the vision of Jesus as the lamb who was slain. Okay, so how is he worthy? You know, at the beginning here, you've got uh, verse two. Everybody look at chapter five, verse two. John recounts that I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, right? A strong angel with a loud voice saying, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And nobody was found. So you've got a, a, a heavenly being, an angel. They're already uh, incredibly strong creatures of God, right? And this angel, even though he is incredibly strong, uh, supernaturally strong, is unworthy to open the seals. How is it that uh, Jesus, as the Lamb of God, is worthy to open the seals? Uh, he's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah, uh, and that is a reference to his human lineage, his tribe. He is uh, Judean. He is, uh, he is of the tribe of Judah. And yet, and, you know, and a lion is a very strong creature, and yet he's not declared worthy to open the scroll by virtue of his strength, but rather Jesus is, is uh, called worthy, or I should say Christ, is called worthy to open the seals of the scroll on the basis of his sacrifice, on the basis of his death and then resurrection. Um, and so it's by the blood that he spilled, by the sacrifice that he made in obedience to God that he is declared worthy to open that seal. So I'll open it up to any questions or comments uh, at this time while I take a little sip on my Brazilian tea. And uh, everybody with us so far? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> No questions on chat so far. So um, we'll keep going. Um, no, no. This is the lamb who was slain. So the image is a comfort to Christians and speaks not only of his sacrifice, but also, of course, of his incarnation, which we've been talking about. Since it is by the sacrifice of the lamb that he becomes both the good shepherd uh, of God's sheep, as well as the Lamb of God. So it's kind of a mixed metaphor. Jesus is both the Lamb of God, meaning the sacrifice, but he is also, by virtue of that incarnation and of his willingness to lay his own life down for the sheep, uh, not only the Lamb himself, but also uh, the good shepherd of the sheep. Pastor Will? Yes, fire away. Uh, when we go back to Genesis, and I think it's Jacob who blesses his 12 sons. Uh, and he gets to Judah. Uh, he goes through the line. Isn't that where the uh, where Judah is first talked about as as a lion? Uh, it yeah, it is. Uh, and then from there, of course, the the image of uh, Judah as a lion um, is pervasive throughout the rest of the Old Testament, and so. Jesus is that fulfillment of that image of Judah as a lion. And so, um, again, it's a reference to his human tribe, his human lineage. You know, you know, we talk about our associations, right? We talk about our, our ethnicity or we talk about our tribe or something like that. When I was in Tanzania, you checked into a hotel and they wanted to know your, you know, the registration form. There was a, like a, you, you fill out your own form. They don't have like a computer. You fill out a piece of paper and it, they ask you for your first name. They ask you for your surname or family name. They ask you for your tribe. <laughs> and so it was funny to me because uh, I would always put the name of the Lutheran Church of Tanzania for my tribe. These are my, these are my people. This is my tribe. But um, of course, they, they still have a tribal society over there in East Africa. And so uh, they really can tell the difference between each other. They know who's what tribe, you know, and um, you know, these human associations we have, they, they are meaningful. Um, there's nothing wrong with having these, these uh, ethnic histories and this uh, sense of people um, because that is in part how we understand our personhood, right? Even Jesus Christ himself understands his own personhood in part due to his tribe. Um, 
it may be weird to think of uh, the Son of God as in some sense tribal, but he, he, he understands his own uh, identity as a person in part in terms of his tribe. He is of the tribe of Judah. And so uh, these associations are obviously not intrinsically sinful. They become sinful when they turn into racism. So it's not wrong for you to be proud of, say, your German heritage, if you are ethnically German or if you're Scott, Scottish or whatever, or, you know, whatever you are. It's not wrong to be, uh, you know, uh, in some ways understanding your personhood in, in terms of that human history. Where it becomes wrong is when it's um, exclusive, meaning your, your people group or your tribe is exalted above all others and, and everybody else is kind of garbage. Um, that's called racism, and that's never anywhere in the scriptures um, condoned. Um, but even though racism is not condoned, it doesn't mean that these human associations like your tribe or your ethnicity or something like that, that they don't mean something to you. This is, this is the exalted Christ. This is Jesus in his heavenly exaltation, and he still uh, is referred to as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and as the root of David. And so um, these family lines, these tribal lines, they, they are part and parcel of who Jesus is as a person, even in his exalted state. Thank you. All right, let's um, <clears throat> keep making some comments here. So um, I, I wanna point out here that from verse 11, forward. So if you look at chapter 5, verse 11 and following there, it says, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Okay. Here's, the, here's kind of the commentary I would, I would offer you to these verses. Uh, the glory that was given to God the Father in chapter 4 right? Because you had the 24 elders falling down, and you had the four living creatures worshiping, and you had the voices of all these angels, right? So the, the glory that is given to God the Father in chapter 4 uh, now moves by way of the worship of the four living creatures and the 24 elders, and then joined by an angelic host uh, here in chapter, uh, in, excuse me, in verse 11, to the Son, okay? So the same worship given the Father is now given the lamb, okay? So the vision of the father is incomplete without the vision of the son thus glorified. And I should point out that this is not a binatarian vision. In other words, this is not a vision of just the father and just the son, but how is the glorified Christ uh, described? Let's go to chapter five, verse six. Chapter 5, verse 6, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And we talked last, uh, well, two weeks ago before Easter, we talked our last meeting, that this reference to the seven spirits of God is not seven individual spirits. It's that seven is a number of wholeness and completeness in all of the scriptures from the Old Testament through the New. And so whenever it talks about the sevenfold spirit of God, it just means the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is standing there as the slain, the crucified one, but he also bears in himself somehow this image of the Holy Spirit, as it were, proceeding from him. And so this is very much a Trinitarian vision. You have the Father, you have the Son in the Lamb of God, right? This line of the tribe of Judah, this root of David. And how does he appear? As a lamb who had been slain, with the spirit, the markings of the Holy Spirit on him. So this is a Trinitarian vision. And so any vision of the Father is incomplete without the Son, and yet this is a, this is a vision of God and who he is. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and um, the, the visions kind of mingle with each other, right? And the worship of the Father is incomplete unless it includes the worship of the Son as co-equal and sharing in the glory of the Father. Remember what uh, we're taught in the, uh, in the epistles of the New Testament? Uh, Paul teaches us that Jesus, although he was and is equal with God in every respect, did not see equality with God a thing to be grasped, but rather humbled himself and taking the form of a servant was obedient 
even to the point of being obedient unto death, even death on a cross, right? So I'm, I didn't get the quote exactly right because I don't have the whole Bible memorized. But y'all remember that, that, uh, that teaching of Paul, I'm sure, right, from your reading of the New Testament. Or even, you know, we read it once a year in church every year, right? As part of the readings, we read that reading once every year. So uh, this is what Paul taught us, that Jesus is and was and is co-equal with, the God, with uh, God the Father in every respect, and yet humbles himself of his own volition, of his own will, he humbles himself, right? But here you've got this, this picture of the worship of the Father, which is incomplete unless it includes worship of the Son as co-equal and sharing in the glory of the Father. Okay, so we got a comment and a question here. Uh, tr Gary Dunker, tribal attachments are part of the Jewish heritage to this day. Yes, very much so, uh, Gary. Uh, Jesus is very much a Jew. <laughs> if anybody was confused uh, about who you worship, you worship a Jewish carpenter. Uh, this is why uh, anti-Semitism to me is insane if you are a Christian because you worship a Jew. Uh, he's very much a Jew. Uh, when he says, is this part of the background for the Nicene Confession who proceeds from the Father and the Son? Winnie, that's a great uh, question. Um, this verse, to my knowledge, is not really part of those debates between the Western Church, uh, where we say in the Creed that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son, and the, the, the filioque is the Latin for that. It's um, so that phrase is called the filioque, and um, it's where in the Western churches, like Lutheran Church, Catholic Church, Episcopalian Church, Presbyterian Church, we all say that the Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son, who together with the Father and the Son is both worshiped and glorified, right? That's, that's, the, that's the clause. Um, in the Eastern Church, like the Eastern Orthodox churches, like the Greek Church or the Russian Church or the Ukrainian Church, they, they don't say that. They say that the Spirit proceeds only from the Father. And so that's Winnie's question to those of you unfamiliar with, with uh, that background in history, and that not all Christian churches have that phrase in their creed like we do in the West. But uh, Winnie, to my knowledge, this isn't one of those verses that came into that debate. The verses that would be part of that debate would be more like from the Gospels, you know, those places, Winnie, where like in John's gospel, after his resurrection, Jesus breathes on his disciples and says, uh, receive the Holy Spirit. That would be one of those verses that kind of came more into the debate because Jesus is breathing on the disciples and saying, receive the Holy Spirit. Well, if, you, if that's not the definition of proceeds from, I'm not really sure what would be. Okay. So does that help? Oh, Winnie is Pastor Bob today. Okay, Bob, does that help? <laughs> Hopefully that helps. I'm not getting a yes or a no, but I, I hope that helps, Bob. Okay. Good. Question. <clears throat> Fire away. Uh, the verse you just quoted i forget what he humbled himself and became a servant etc cetera, etc cetera. right can we um was it only in his human form that jesus humbled himself uh i i can't think that it went beyond that because as god himself he he couldn't humble himself in his divine uh uh in his divine form could he yeah, that's a great point. So uh, that verse does refer to Jesus' humiliation, meaning his willingness to take up uh, human flesh and the human condition, because it says he humbles himself and became a servant, right? So absolutely. And yet Jesus uh, said in his earthly ministry that not even he knows the hour at which the end will come, only the Father knows that. And so um, there is some sense in which uh, this relationship between the Father and the Son, though co-equal, there's a reason we say that one is the father and we say that the other one is the son. These are analogies, guys, right? Um, Jesus is not the son of the father in the human sense, right, of like a human birth. We use these analogies to try to, to, try to understand the relationship within the Godhead. And these analogies 
these analogous titles, were given to us by God himself in the scriptures. And so it is a great mystery, and yet there's some sense in which one is the Father who is not the Son, and, and they can't be interchanged. And one is the Son who is not the Father, and they cannot be interchanged. And that those, those words that we use for them, Father, Son, depict some sort of specific relationship that is filial, that is, um, or that is fatherly, if you run it the other direction. Um, and yet they are co-equal. They are both God. And so the worship due one is, is worship that is due the other. But you're right, it is a profound mystery. Uh, I think it's in Hebrews, I'm not sure, but where, where Jesus is even referred to as the Father. I, I can't point, pinpoint the, the verse, but it's something I stumbled across a while back, back and made me think that, uh, of how closely the Trinity is close. Right. Um, if you can find that, then text it to me this week. Uh, you and I sometimes go back and forth, John, on text. Text that to me this week. But what we want to be careful of is that the confession of the whole Christian church on earth is that the Father is the Father and not the Son, and that you cannot confuse the persons, and that the Son is the Son and not the Father, and you cannot confuse the persons. And the church arrived at that confession by a close examining of the scriptures themselves. And so I don't remember a verse like that. But if you can find it and we can discuss it, um, I'd love to discuss it with you this week. How's that sound? Amen. Cool. Uh, we're going to keep going here. If I can. There it goes. Let's move into Revelation 6, guys. We're just flying. Look at this. We're going to make some headway today. I'm determined to make some headway. Um, so in Revelation 6, we get the first of the three sevenfold visions concerning the history of the world from the ascension of Christ to his second advent or second coming in the end of the world. Um, hopefully everybody remembers because I spent several weeks trying to drill this into your head. I'm going to continue to drill it into your head so that you've got this as your framework for reading Revelation. Um, different Christian groups have in the past and do today read revelation differently okay there's a whole bunch of assumptions that go in excuse me that go into sort of the the lenses the glasses that you're using when you're reading any book and also when you're reading the scriptures here's the assumption that we're using we are using the assumption that many christian groups when they're trying to interpret revelation get lost in the weeds of all the details of this symbol means this. When I turn on CNN and I see a world events, I'm going to relate that to this rider on this horse. But then later when I see something different in the New York Times, I'm going to relate that to when uh, this censure, this bowl of God's wrath was unleashed upon the earth later in Revelation or something like that. Christian groups <clears throat> that try to make a one-to-one -one comparison of the his, like the, the news events that they see in the news, and then what they read in Revelation kind of get lost in the weeds. And what I mean by that is that we are taking these visions to be a cycle that is repeated three times. It is a sevenfold vision. So every time you see this cycle repeated, you see a vision of seven signs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven signs, okay? And then that, that whole cycle of the seven signs is repeated a second time and a third time. So that's the three sevenfold visions. Now, why three? Because everything in scripture is made sure on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So if it's repeated three times, that would make the thing sure and certain. Melissa, you raised your hand. Just to go, sorry to interrupt you, but just to go back to something very interesting in um chapter five that an old old testament professor said at one point okay. um, at the very be it was it's beautiful he said that um normally the kings would open scrolls so it says who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals and that's mm -hmm. when the king i think would normally open it and then there's this big pause and then the fact that jesus is opening it is a um reinforces the fact that he's king absolutely absolutely thank you for that comment Yep. Um, there's, 
Does everybody feel comfortable that you understand what we're saying with three sevenfold visions? I can't see videos or people shaking their heads or giving yeah. thumbs up. Okay. So um, these sevenfold visions, every time it's repeated, the, the time period in history that it's covering is the ascension of Jesus Christ all the way to his second advent, or many people say second coming. Why do I keep insisting on second advent? Well, because as Lutheran Christians, y'all are already used to celebrating advent before we get into the Christmas season. Advent, adventus, just means like arrival, okay? So it's Jesus' first arrival. And he's going to have a second coming. That's his second advent. So why do I insist on using that word? Because I want to tie it to your worship life. You're already used to talking about advent. I want you to think of Jesus' second arrival, his second advent, okay? His second coming at the end of the world. There's a word here to be said about typology of symbols used in apocalyptic literature when referencing natural phenomena versus supernatural phenomena that are on full display here. Okay, because we're going to get into the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Again, this is one of those places where hopefully I'm giving you all kind of like a life hack, like how to read scripture easier. And so this is one of those places where I hope you'll be able to hold on to this knowledge and just kind of file it away because this is going to make reading apocalyptic literature like Revelation or like Daniel in the Old Testament a whole lot easier. Here's the way it goes with apocalyptic literature. If the writer is giving you a vision of natural events in human history, then that writer will give you that vision in symbols that are taken from daily earthly human life. So when you've got four horsemen, that's part of daily human life. We've all seen a man and we've all seen a man get on a horse and ride it, okay? That's daily human life before a hundred and something years ago when we invented cars. The whole history of humanity was humans riding on a horse, okay? That's very earthly in its imagery, and it's meant to show earthly, like very natural kinds of happenings that are under God's permissive will. I'll get more to that in a minute. When the writers of an apocalyptic vision want to show you supernatural powers or supernatural occurrings, they'll come up, they'll not come up with, like John didn't see this, but they're, they always present it as a vision of something that's so weird that there's no way that could be earthly, such as the four living creatures. Each of these cherubim have four faces, and they're covered all over in eyes, and they have six wings. Now, what do you know on earth that looks like that? Nothing. And so that is very much a heavenly supernatural vision. But the, the symbols being used when we get into chapter 6 here of Revelation and the four horsemen, this is very earthly. And so we're going to be looking, first of all, at very earthly, natural, not supernatural at all, very earthly conditions for life between the ascension of Jesus Christ and his return at his second advent, or you could say second coming. Does everybody understand what I just said? Or does that not make sense outside my own head? Everybody's nodding their heads. Good. Pastor, mm -hmm. could you just repeat that again, what you just said? Sure. I uh, just want to make sure I get it clear. Sure. So whenever you're reading apocalyptic literature, and Revelation is apocalyptic, that's the genre. Like when you say, I'm reading the gospel according to St. Matthew. That's the genre, right? Um, it's the type of literature it is. Whenever you're reading apocalyptic, if, if you see images that are taken from everyday human earthly life, then that symbol, because we know that Revelation is written in symbols, right? That symbol has to correspond to something very natural, not supernatural. But if you see a vision of something that is not natural, like again, I'll go back to the cherubim. Each one has four faces. No earthly creature has four faces. They're all covered over in eyes. No earthly creature is covered over in eyes like that, okay? If you see something that is so not natural, not part of everyday human life, then that 
either is the thing itself, like with an angelic being, like a cherub, right? Or it stands for something supernatural. It can stand for a supernatural godly power. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, Thanks. good. So we're going to talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I'm just going to read chapter six and then we'll go back to it. Now I watched when the lamb opened one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, come. And I looked and behold a white horse and its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him and he came out conquering and to conquer. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. And I looked and behold, a black horse and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed with him, or your translation may say, and Hell followed with him, and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been killed. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Okay. There's some what? Chat, where's, I don't know where, I don't see that. The outline to help understand something in the back is called Fishnet because the local books are only published in online form and need to be sold in bulk. Yes. Okay. This is, you're right. We, Rich, we are in Nebraska. If I try to help you with something, I should say this is the Cliff Notes version because Cliff Notes uh, originated in Nebraska. So good. Um, so as we're looking at the seven seals here and we start with the four horsemen, here's, here's what I want to say again. This is, this is the Cliff Notes version, Rich. This is the Cliff Notes to how to understand this. You'll get lost in the weeds if you turn on CNN and you try to match up things you see in the news with particular images. So for example, if you take the first rider who's got a bow and a crown and he's riding a white horse and you try to match him up with some guy like a dictator or somebody that you saw on CNN, right? Like the dictator of North Korea or something like that. You're gonna get lost in the weeds because the idea here with Revelation, and this is the way we're reading it, guys. We're just reading it this way, okay? Not all Christian groups read it this way. This is how we're gonna read it. Because I'm telling you, it makes the most sense. It, because it, it doesn't create a confusing situation. It creates a situation where it's understandable. And this book was not written so that Christians can sit around and be confused. This book was written down so that Christians could sit around and take comfort and encouragement from the Word of God. So if your assumption, and that's my assumption, is that God meant for us to understand this, then it needs to be understandable, okay? So these visions, these sevenfold visions, and this is the first of them with the seven seals, it's meant to show us the general conditions under which we will be living until Christ comes again. So that when we live under those conditions, we don't have to sit around and be perplexed or enter into despair. 
but we can understand that we were told that this is the way that it's going to go, and we can continue to trust in Christ in the meantime. Okay? So if we take this vision of the four horsemen and we say that this is going to be what it's like between Christ's ascension and when he comes again, this is the general sort of uh, conditions under which we will be living, then we can interpret it that way. So let's take this first rider. The first rider um, had a bow and a crown was given to him and he came out conquering and to conquer and he's on a white horse. Okay. Let's take the horse. Horse is white. In all of scripture, whether you're talking about the Old Testament or the New Testament, white is a symbol of being holy. White is, a, white is, the, is the color of the robes that the saints are given in heaven. It's a, it's a sign of God's holiness. This guy's got a crown, so he really is a real king. And he's got a bow, not a sword. Now that's interesting. And then this guy's got a sword. We'll get to that in a minute. But usually in scripture, a sword is, like if it's divine, a sword is only uh, given by God or is a symbol of God. Like in the very beginning of Revelation, you remember that the vision of the exalted Jesus Christ is that a sharp two-edged sword proceeded from his mouth, okay? But in the Old Testament, and there are lots of examples of this in the prophets, so guys like Zephaniah, Zechariah, Ezekiel, all these, all these cats, right, that you read in your Old Testament, the bow, or David with the Psalms, right, every time David mentions this in the Psalms, a bow is what's used to symbolize earthly kingship and earthly militaristic conquest and earthly warfare. The sword is normally reserved for God's, like the way he divides the human heart. A bow is a symbol of warfare. At the time of the writing of Revelation, the only mounted archers that the Roman Empire ever came into contact with were called the Parthians. Um, the Huns are not on the scene yet, right? Um, and Genghis Khan and his Mongolian hordes have not swept across the world yet. The only mounted horsemen that were known to anybody living within the Roman Empire were called the Parthians. But they were so fierce and so fast and so good at what they did that even the mighty Roman Empire was unable to subjugate them. And they remained free, outroaming the steppes of, of uh, Asia there, okay? So uh, this idea of a, of a bowman is an idea of earthly militaristic conquest and of tyranny. So this king with his bow on a white horse is symbolic of a guy who conquers, it says, and who is going to conquer. And he does so by claiming that he has a divine right to conquer. Now, if you think back to history class or any book you've ever read on history, how many times, how many conquerors of the world, whether you're talking about Alexander the Great or you're talking about one of the great emperors of China or whether you're talking about the Romans themselves, how many, whether you're talking about Manifest Destiny, now that, that's going to get some people ruffled, but when you're talking about American history and Manifest Destiny, what did we say gave us the right to conquer everybody between here and the Pacific Ocean? We said God gave us the right. That's what we did, okay? So every time you see a conqueror, in human history, they often claim, God said I can do this, and that I have divine backing and divine right for what I'm doing, okay? So this is a general state of human existence between the ascension of Jesus Christ and the second coming of Christ, is that the rule will not be peace, the rule will not be liberty or human freedom, the rule will be tyranny, the rule will be militaristic conquest. It doesn't just have to be militarism, though, because the guy's riding a white horse, which means he claims divine authority. It can be any time somebody claims divine authority or quasi-divine authority for the kind of tyranny that they have over other people. It can be a parent who says, I'm a parent, and the fourth commandment says, you must obey me. And they use that to uh, subjugate and control their children. It can be uh, a pastor 
a member of the clergy who says, well, I, I am the occupier of the office that Christ instituted, and therefore you have to do whatever I say about whatever. Roman Catholic popes, excuse me, <coughs> I think I have the coronavirus, excuse me, I'm coughing a lot with my um, Roman Catholic popes, excuse me. So anyway, so anytime that clergy claim this divine right and then use that for like tyrannical purposes over other people, right? Anytime someone claims God's authority and that's their reason for tyranny over other people, this is the same sort of thing. But it can also just refer to general militarism. So communist regimes, great example of this, right? Any kind of militarism that dominates, subjugates, uh, tyrannizes, uh, this is what we're talking about. And that is the, uh, the general state of what it's going to be like living in, in, in the world until Christ comes again. Um, So we got several comments here. Great, great comments. Let's uh, look at them here. Uh, so Wade says, in reference to Jesus being the one with the sword, Jesus said in Matthew, do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Yes, and uh, usually we understand him to be referencing the Old Testament prophecies that say that the Messiah, the Savior, will strike the, the earth with the sword of his mouth, and we get that same uh, reference in Revelation as well, okay? And so what divides people is not Jesus as a militaristic conqueror. What divides people is Jesus and his teaching or the offense of his cross, okay? Uh, this is part of, though, Wade, I'll say this to you, this is part of why people misunderstood Jesus' mission so badly. They thought he was going to be a militaristic leader. Um, but Jesus was not, he said, he said his kingdom is not of this world, right? And yet he also said, I didn't come to bring peace. It's not peaceful in your house if a father and a son are divided concerning the person and work of Jesus. If one believes and the other doesn't, or if a husband believes and a wife doesn't, or vice versa, there's no peace in the home. Okay, so Jesus did bring a sword. That's the sword of his mouth, his teaching, and I hope that that helps. And is that uh, with the sword long gospel? Yeah, sword is long gospel. Uh, that's a good Lutheran shorthand. So it's double edged. So it divides that way. So long gospel. You take it to the Psalter, where David says, "One thing have you said, O Lord, but two words have I heard." So one united teaching from God, and yet I heard two things, like two sides of the same coin, law and gospel. Uh, Steve, Steve says, does that make the first horseman a liar, or do they really believe that they have the right to conquer from God? I think many of them do believe what they're saying. I think they do believe they have uh, the divine right. Many Chinese emperors talked about the mandate of heaven. Uh, were we lying as Americans when we said we had a right to wipe out the Sioux Nation as we were moving west across Nebraska? because of manifest destiny. We didn't lie. We really did believe that God gave us the right to take over that land and to subjugate that people. I mean, that's what we believed, okay? Um, okay, Sid, your dad's got a question, far away. Okay, okay, go. Um, all of these conquerings that you've been mentioning, Yes. Um, yeah. Are, are bloody conquerings. And I have a note in my Bible, and I don't remember when it was from or, or who, who I was learning this from or anything, but is there any significance that this particular conquering is a bloodless conquering since he has no arrow, just the bow? The bow would be significant for the, uh, for the, the right to authority but without the arrow, this could be a bloodless conquering. Is there any significance to that at all? Uh, okay, so great question. So uh, whenever you're looking at the Old Testament or the New Testament and a bow is mentioned, it's mentioned as synecdoche. So that's a part for the whole. So um, it's never understood that it's a bow without an arrow because you, you wouldn't go into battle with a bow without an arrow. So it's a synecdoche. It's mentioning a part for the whole. So it's a bow and arrow system. It's a it's a projectile system. Like we say a rifle, I got my rifle, 
that usually means you got some ammo, right? You got some bullets. And so uh, we, we mention a part for the whole sometimes. And that's the same thing with this projectile weapon that predated rifles. Uh, that's, what a, that's what a bow is. It's a projectile weapon. And so it's, it's a bow and arrows. And yes, I have been mentioning bloody conflicts, but remember I also mentioned uh, conflicts that result in tyranny that are bloodless, such as when a, a pastor or pope claims divine authority for the tyranny that they keep over other people, that's bloodless, and yet it's still mind manipulation. Uh, the same thing with a parent to a child. When a parent says to a child, well, there's a fourth commandment, you have to honor me and what I say, and they use that law of God to manipulate their children, that's also bloodless, and yet it's very damaging. Um, and so I'm trying to make sure that I mention both kinds of conflict, the bloody kind and the bloodless kind. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, yep. Okay, cool. Uh, great question, though. Uh, Wade says, right, not the kind, the people we were looking for. That, that was 2020. Okay, that was for Okay, so Jennifer says, could this include the time we are living in now with the limiting of our freedoms by our government? Well, Jennifer, I would say it, it sort of depends on the governor and it sort of depends on the local mayor. Uh, we've seen some, over, some overreaching and the Department of Justice, the Federal Department of Justice has uh, slapped some wrists already. Um, and there's some back and forth between our current president and our current governors in the different states on how they're supposed to reopen. What I would say is that, again, we're not, we're, we're trying not to take headlines in the news and do a one-to-one -one relationship with a symbol from Revelation. Jennifer, that's how you're going to get lost in the weeds. So if you say that this first writer is like the governor of Michigan, who is clearly overstepped in some areas, right, then you're going to get lost in the weeds because you're not seeing that, that what this is saying is that this is the general state of human affairs until Christ comes again. So it's not so much individual governors. It is more the fact that we should be prepared as Christians that having actual liberty and living in peace and freedom is the exception until Jesus comes again and not the rule. The rule, the general rule is, those who, who can grab power will grab it until Jesus comes back, and they will use that power in tyrannical ways very often. Does that help, Jennifer? Yes, this is Jennifer Pastor. Um, it does help. It just seems maybe we've been lulled into a sense of, of peace before all this COVID came out that now we're surprised that we have to fight or experience some oppression where in our country we haven't had that for a long time. Right, and, and I, I would say it's been slow coming though. Uh, my wife sitting beside me, she just said that, and I, I would agree. It, it's been slow coming, but you're right. We do kind of lull ourselves maybe in our context. We've been We've been very blessed in the United States. What a wonderful country to live in. Um, I, I love living in this country, right? So uh, we live in a wonderful country and we've experienced some wonderful liberties and freedoms for, for many, many generations. And so it, it causes us to maybe believe that that's the rule, but that's really the exception uh, to human existence until Christ comes again. It's one of the reasons why as an American, I would say, our liberties and our freedoms are very precious and they should be protected because it's such an exception to have such liberty. It's such an exception in world history to have such freedoms. And so we should want to protect those liberties and freedoms under our constitution. Um, but we wanna remember that we, we really wanna be careful not to do a one-to-one -one comparison between headlines or what's going on right this very second with just one of the writers because We'll miss, as Bob says here, he's got a comment. Once you label one rider, you limit seeing each horse and rider as the, the general application of a rule. And, and the reason this is important to see these riders as a general application of a rule for Christians like you and me until Christ comes again is, is one very simple reason. Guys and gals, we need to be prepared for tribulation, persecution, how to live under it, how to rejoice under suffering and, and being hard-pressed from every side, as Paul says, right? 
We, we really need to train ourselves like a fighting force. We need to train ourselves not to, not for, you know, I say like a fighting force because I'm not, I'm not advocating armed conflict. But what I am saying is that we need to train ourselves to live in a situation where tyranny is the rule rather than personal liberty and freedom. We need to train ourselves to rejoice in a world where tyranny is the rule rather than personal liberty and freedom. And we find that source of joy and that comfort and that strength and, and all, the, all of that power in the empty tomb of Jesus Christ, in the leading of the Holy Spirit in the congregation, right? And so when we find that strength as a community of Christians together, it's powerful, man. It's very, very powerful. And no tyrannical government can squash it. Great examples. The communist regime in China cannot squash the underground Christian church. They can't squash us no matter what they do. And we're not even fighting with guns. We're not, we're not even fighting. We're just resisting. And they can't squash us, right? Or uh, the, the Ayatollahs of Iran, this, this uh, radical Muslim theocracy that they've got over there, cannot squash the, the underground Christian church. When Christians find their footing and they come to understand tyranny is going to be the rule, not personal freedom then they're ready as a, as a group of Christians in a Christian community to, to stand up under that weight with joy, with the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and we're able to say, just like our Christian brothers and sisters in Tanzania wrote once in a letter to their government, no living creature can intimidate the church of Jesus Christ, right? And they're able to look you in the eye and say it, right? And, and so um, that's really what we're trying to go for here, guys. I want you to get comfort from this book. Of Revelation, I want you to get strength from it too. I want you to 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 learn and to train yourselves as a congregation uh, to to live like this. Okay, we got a lot of comments coming in. Um, Eunice says, "Can you imagine what it was like a hundred years ago in the last pandemic?" Yeah, you know, it was uh, really rough. Uh, Nineteen eighteen and the Spanish flu. Or, of course, uh, Memphis, Tennessee suffered uh, several rounds of uh, yellow fever from uh, the 1800s into the 1900s. Of course, that, that's not burned into the memory of the whole country because we're talking about pockets, you know, so pockets of people in different places. And, of course, people didn't travel as much back then. So a pocket of yellow fever remained in Memphis. It didn't go anywhere else, right? But, but this has happened before. Anand says, God warned us that this kind of, uh, of this kind of tyranny when the Israelites asked for a king. Yes, from the very beginning, uh, Rick or Christina or both of you, whoever said that, that's absolutely correct. From the very beginning, uh, God warned us that whenever you have a king, you have this kind of tyranny. And so, so again, it's not one kind of tyranny. It can be a pope. It can be a king. It can be an emperor. It can be the Communist Party. It can be whoever, right? Uh, an American uh, governor right, of a, of a particular state. Anytime somebody claims God's authority, because they think, they think that they're saving everybody, right? They think that they're doing this for God and everybody else, right? And they use it to, to, to become a tyrant over their fellow man. That's the general rule, not the exception, but the general rule from the time that Christ ascended to the time that he comes again. So don't be surprised by it, okay? Um, Dan Pastor Will. Uh, hold, hold on just a second. Uh, Carol, I'll get right back to you. Dan says, we celebrate this kind of new thinking every day we face death at funerals, as we approach death ourselves with family members, etc. right? Yes, we do. As Christians, Dan, yes, we do. Um, we have an opportunity to celebrate this new thinking. And this new thinking is a great way to put it, Dan, because you're talking like Paul. What does Paul say? Paul's trying to get us ready. But here in Revelation, we have another way of coming at this training. Paul says, be renewed daily in the renewing of your minds, right? In new thinking. When Jesus says repent, what's that word in Greek? Metanoia, change your thinking, change your mind. That's what it means in Greek, right? So we have these opportunities to change our thinking. Wade says each generation has these elite, the wealthy and powerful that feel a sense of entitlement and or right in which their agendas are forced upon the people via fear and manipulation of the common people. I'm going to stop there. Wade, you're absolutely right. Guess what else? When the church tries to pay, play the power game, we can fall into the same thing. I want to make this clear, guys. In the middle of the tribulations we're going to have to go through, where tyranny is the rule, not the exception, I want us all to remember 
that the Christian has power, great power from the Holy Spirit, under the neighbor to support and serve the neighbor's needs. We do not have power over our neighbor. That would make us the same as the, tyr as the tyrants that we, that we face and that we resist as the Christian church. Everybody with me about that? I hope you are. Um, it's easy to see if you connect the dots between these people relative to COVID-19 situation. The point is not new. It's just newer to us in the U.S. as we've been largely spoiled for a few hundred years. It is, uh, is it comfortable? Heck no. But we have the ultimate comfort in Christ. Praise God that we will still win the end. That's absolutely right. And again, it's the general situation. It doesn't, I know you're using COVID-19 just as an example, Wade, and you're absolutely right. But we want to make sure, and I, I can't stress this enough because I'm trying, to, I'm trying to do a little teaching right now. I'm trying to do a little coaching. Do not get lost in the weeds. Don't take just one thing that could be a great example. Wade, this is a great example. But don't take the one example and make it just fit that rider. It's every time that you have this kind of tyranny. It can be a parent to a child. It can be a clergyman. It can be a king or an emperor or a party. Okay? So, but great point, Wade. I love, I love your point. Uh, Carol? Well, it's very simple. In the Lutheran Study Bible, it says, accordingly, the rider on this white horse should be taken as a symbol of mankind's insatiable hunger for power and its penchant for aggression. Right. It's in a nutshell right there. Yeah, that's it. Um, hmm. Buddy, don't say it to me. <laughs> it's all awesome. My wife is shy. She doesn't like to be in the spotlight. <laughs> I think it helps if you learn, like if you read it this way, mm -hmm. it's where it's something that is constantly going to be happening, it's just the way you live. Mm -hmm. So they're not continuously so they're shocked and, and like horrified, like how this could possibly happen. Mm -hmm. Why did God allow this, that kind of a thinking? Mm -hmm. uh, because he already warned us. Mm -hmm. So the moments of nice and peace and freedom is like an ice in the cake and it's great, mm -hmm. but we shouldn't be shocked when it's happening right. when he told us to happen and it's probably going to happen multiple times in everybody's life right. in different situations. In different situations. That's right. And so experience personal freedom and liberty. It's a day at the beach. Enjoy it for all it's worth. Uh, and then the general rule guys and gals is uh, unfortunately tyranny until Christ comes again. Why? because there is only one truly divinely appointed king. Who is that king? Uh, Wade was talking about it in his comment on the text, for everybody to see. Jesus Christ is the king. Uh, amen, Wade. I'm with you, brother, okay? So, um, so I, I meant to get uh, farther, further. I don't know if it's by degree or just by the words on the page. Um, I meant to get a little more down the road here but I'm glad we got into the four horsemen. I'm glad we spent this time on the first horseman and understanding this as a, as a description of a general situation, a general condition of humanity uh, before the end. And the reason that I'm glad is because um, it'll help us a lot with the rest of the horsemen after this beginning next week, okay? Because once you get that this is the way we're reading it, it makes the other horsemen fall into place a whole lot easier. And it makes, again, it makes the book understandable rather than confusing. I, I, my big, yeah, I see Rich's comment about the good guys and the bad guys. And the, um, so what I'll say is this, and we're a little over time, but what I'll say is this, guys. Um, the, the point of revelation is not to confuse Christians. I cannot say that enough. People get intimidated by this book, but the point of, of Revelation is to comfort, encourage, build up Christians, uh, challenge Christians, but it's never to confuse Christians. And so you're going to see once we've spent this time on the first rider, beginning next week with all the other riders, man, it's just going to fall into place for you. And it becomes very understandable and applicable to your everyday Christian walk. And that's my hope, guys and gals. I, I hope that y'all get so much out of this because it's one of my favorite books of the entire Bible. And um, it, it's just so encouraging. And, and it, it's, like, it's like lifting weights you know, for your soul. It's like really bodybuilding stuff. And, and I, I think you're gonna find the same is true for you. So uh, I love you. Uh, Jesus loves you. 
Have a great week in the Lord. And uh, wait, I guess I should ask, are there any final questions or comments from anybody else besides me? Seeing none. I love you. Jesus loves you. Uh, take care to uh, check out the online worship resources. And we will catch you right here the same bat time and bat channel uh, next Sunday. Have a great day in the Lord.